Check one, two. Test one, two, test.
Check one, two, check. Hello. Test, test. Okay. Ready to go. Uh, our guest arrived, Hello. courtesy of Southwest? Southwest Airlines. Southwest Airlines. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll introduce myself. I think most of you know I'm Bill Lacey, the director of the Dole Institute. I don't usually speak at the study groups except the first and the last, so I just wanted to come by. Thank you all of you for attending today, and especially thank Johanna Masca, and C.J. Jackson. They have done a fantastic job as our spring fellows. <laughs> and they will introduce our really special guest today, but I, I believe, I would have to go back and historically check this, but I believe this is the first discussion group in the history of the Dole Institute that has been entirely populated by KU grads. So yeah. that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's pretty cool. So thank you, and let's give them a big round of applause for the job they've done. Thank you, so yeah. We, so we could do this. Am I on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So we could do this. We can do rock, shock, J, hawk, go, K. Woo! <laughs> So I, I have to first say, Marlon has gone through a lot to get here today. His flights have been delayed since a very early morning. And I am so grateful that you uh, were able to join us. Yeah, Marlon, uh, and you get to talk to a reporter after getting here. <laughs> so that sounds like a great time, right? Um, so we, uh, first of all, I want to thank Bill for the opportunity <laughs> to do this. Johanna and I have had such a good semester coming back and forth. Um, I think our son has had the the worst semester because he keeps <laughs> missing mom and dad, but w but he knows it's important, and we've uh, we're really grateful for the opportunity to come home and share what we've learned and bring cool people uh, and Marlon here. <laughs> 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 no, so um, wh wh which one of us gets to do the introduction of Marlon Marshall? I think that should I start and then you finish? I'll fill in factual details. So yeah. Marlon Marshall, I first met here at the University of Kansas when he was the student body vice president and I was here at the University of Kansas, and I was uh, getting involved in, in student government and always looked up to Marlon, who has always been one of the most respectful and um, engaging campaigners I've ever known. I know he went out to Missouri and started working for John Kerry when I was still, you know, uh, roving in state politics and, you yeah. know. And, um, and then we had the privilege of working together uh, for President Obama. Um, CJ, do you want to continue? Sure. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I've had this unique position to watch both Johanna and Marlon uh, get involved in democratic politics. I knew Marlon a little bit in uh, college, but Marlon was, um, you've, if you've been to a few of these discussion groups, you can tell which partner in this marriage is cooler than the other. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Marlon, <laughs> let's just say, let's just say, Marlon operated at a social strata that was beyond humble student journalists in my time. <laughs> Marlon could like fist bump the door guy at a bar and get in, and <laughs> I was still waiting in line. Um, it, was, it was actually really fun when I, I introduced CJ to Marlon at some so point. But, uh, Marlon and Johanna, uh, after uh, Marlon worked on the Kerry campaign, um, 
uh, Marlon and Johanna both signed up for different candidates in 2008. And I'm, you know, we'll you remember us emailing back and forth? Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember. I got CC'd on this email exchange between the two of them, kind of talking smack from early states in 2008. <laughs> and I, I was think like, it was guys, all like, you know, just help each other out. Yeah. Whoever wins this one. Right. <laughs> uh, so Marlon, Marlon uh, played an important role on uh, each of uh, Senator Clinton's victories in the 2008 primary yeah. campaign. I don't think that you had a loss, right? Yep. Right. No, he, he was actually always victorious. Yep. And it um, turns out I had gone to Iowa, and then I jumped to South Carolina, and you were in uh, Nevada, and then what was Ohio? Ohio, Ohio which, yeah. yeah. You guys, you guys like totally, totally so beat us. <laughs> um, so Marlon, Marlon uh, played a huge role in a bunch of these states. Um, ha much like Johanna had a really interesting ground level view of democratic politics, although they were performing different roles on the respective campaigns. Uh, then um, they came to get, which uh, in a move very un you know unusual for Democrats, they came together and stopped bickering and. Uh, that's my observation as a reporter. <laughs> and, uh, and they worked on the Obama campaign in 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, Marlon, you were in Ohio, is that right? No, or Missouri? Missouri. Missouri. Marlon took, uh, Marlon led Senator Clinton to a bunch of wins and took his first L for President Obama. Go figure. <laughs> um, and that guy got elected. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how that works. Uh, then Marlon worked for the State Department, um, got uh, continued to work uh, for campaigns and played a hugely influential role on President Obama's 2012 campaign. Can't you hear? I'm we sorry. We have to, I'm yeah. you know, okay. we have to hold it a little Hi. closer, I think. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, and then worked for the White House. And then um, the last time, I feel like I've s I see Marlon, uh, he's like a comet, and I see him for a few minutes. And uh, the last time I saw him, he was headed to Brooklyn and had kind of a steely gaze in his eye and knew what was ahead of him. Um, but we're really ex – and Mar Marlon played a huge role in uh, Secretary Clinton's campaign. But w what I'm excited to talk to Marlon about today is um, we've spent so much time focused on what President Trump is doing, his agenda. But a huge part of the first 100 days of a new presidency is also how the other party reacts to um, a new leader. Um, and in this case, uh, you know, control of both uh, the House and the Senate. Um, Marlon has, uh, like any good political operative or person who's worked in government, been on both sides of the winning and losing equation here. Um, and so, uh, Marlon, uh, you know, you, um, first of all, what w take us back to election night, which may be a little bit of PTSD. Sure. Um, what was your reaction? And like, can you, you know, can you put us like in the frame of how you and you know um, your your fellow campaign staffers took in the information and and you know kind of uh, as much as, without making it traumatic, relive it a little bit for us. 2016? Yes. Oh, just had to ask. Been, been many of election nights. If, if, you'd, <laughs> if you'd like, we can talk about a happier time later. No, no, no <laughs> we'll go with 2016. Uh, first, thank you guys for having me back. Uh, thank you guys for coming. I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, I was supposed to be here at 11 a.m. this morning. But, um, <laughs> uh, but I'm here, and that's what's most important, and uh, is awesome. Anytime I'm like back, even in the vicinity of Kansas, um, you know, sometimes I go home to St. Louis, I'm from St. Louis, I see my family, and I feel like I'm still like four hours away from KU is like still close enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I feel a good vibe, and so being here is, uh, gives me a, a, a good spirit. So thank you for coming. Um, 2016, so election night was tough. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, I remember that night, and we were in a room um, making decisions throughout the day on what to do and what states, which th at that time point in time, most decision making was done. Um, and we were watching um, the news, had a couple different news stations on, so we could kind of see what was happening. Uh, and uh, the first indication was Florida, as it started looking good at first and then started going south. Um, and as, you know, basically when they called Florida saying we were gonna lose by two, I think the question I had in my mind was, is that a, is the way the electorate performed a trend overall, right. or is it, um, you know, was Florida just mm -hmm. Florida? Because Florida is mm -hmm. Florida. Um, and then a couple more states came in. Everything was a little bit tighter than we uh, what we expected at the time. Um, and I don't think I fully, me personally, I went to try to be a leader because I had a team there, and right. 
some were experienced and some were not. And um, I tried to just, you know, lead by example. And uh, when we got late enough in the night where it was kind of clear what was going to happen, I obviously in internally was a little bit more in shock than I was angry at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, mostly tried to make sure my team was okay and just said, you know, we all fought the good fight and we're going to wake up in the morning and the secretary is going to give some, some remarks. Uh, and that's what's most important right now. And go get some rest because they haven't had any rest in a few days, mm -hmm. a few years. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so that's that's kind of how I went about it. And it didn't probably really crystallize until the morning. So, I mean, this is a thing that I don't – like we have a lot of uh, students in the audience who are involved in politics. Wins and losses are win – wins and losses and inability to hold the microphone close to your mouth <laughs> are very common, yeah. right? Um, you've been through this process where you've had – two uh, tremendous victories that you participated in, um, and also two, I mean, any pre every uh, presidential campaign is its own kind of um, battle, but you've, you've experienced losing. But you have staffers there who have never experienced this before, right? Um, uh, how, did th how did they process it, or how do you help them process it? Because you've been, you obviously this is an experience, um, you know, power, s power swings on a pendulum, right? Yeah, totally. I in terms of processing, there's a couple things you have to do. I think one is um, just as again as a leader of a team, just be there for your people, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and let them go through whatever stages of processing they need to. Um, but then, too, to your point, is just also give your experience, right? Yeah. And what I find is publicly, when you win, you're perfect, you're amazing, mm -hmm. right? This campaign was great. Oh my mm -hmm. God, they did everything right. <laughs> um, <laughs> And when you lose, it's like, you're terrible. Oh, my God. How'd you do ah. um, And they're both right. And they're right, exactly right. <laughs> um, and, what I, and what I appreciate, actually, on the Obama campaign, uh, particularly in 2012, was when we won, even though the press narrative was amazing, um, internally we still did a good analysis and a good debrief on mm -hmm. what worked, what can we do better next time. We tried to help whoever was going to run in 16, ultimately Hillary or Clinton, uh, learn from the things that we did. Um, and so for us, and you know, it was still the same way where what did we do well, what could we have done better, um, and make sure that we can leave some something behind for those uh, mm -hmm. uh, in 2020. Um, so mostly, again, leading by example. And the, the thing I love the most about campaigns and why I do campaigns is that um, the you create, if you do it right, a culture of family. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just... Hats off to Robbie Mook, who's my campaign manager, who I worked with. That was like the umpteenth campaign I worked on with it's him. It's like 78 campaigns. Exactly, like 79. Um, mm -hmm. But he really created a family culture. And the mm -hmm. next day in our office, he we got everyone in this big room. Uh, and he talked to the team. He spoke very personally. He talked about how he was worried for the country moving forward, how he has uh, nieces, and given some of the things that you know Trump said at the time that concerned him. Uh, but also, he told everyone to like. If there's one thing that I know, um, and this is why I can sleep at night, is that um, even assuming that we were up the whole time in the campaign, uh, everyone worked their tails off. Right? It wasn't like no one held back and like, oh, we're kind of not going to work today. Everyone like, I mean, we'd be 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. People would go home and then come back at eight. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So. Um, he really encouraged people to just take the fact that like they fought the good fight and for the right reasons. Uh, and I think over time, people really believe that. I often say that I lose, uh, I learn more when I lose than when I win because you, I think it's to your point, Marlon, you, you analyze yourself more when, when you've lost. Um, so, you know, I think we both having gone through so many states, in the primary slash caucus election um, back in 2007 have a different perspective than someone who's this is their first campaign. Um, and so, you know, I saw it a lot because we were teaching at USC and you had students going, oh my gosh, what just happened? And you have to go back to, you know, when, when you and I, we're working, you know, to, I remember being a student for Al Gore mm -hmm. and, you know, wanting Al Gore to win. And we went into the Bush administration and you say, it's, it's, 
going to be okay. <laughs> it's going to be okay. Right. But I guess that's the transition that we all make is now with um, Republicans holding, um, you know, the House, the Senate, and the White House, uh, Democrats regrouping. It's on so many different levels, right? So, well, yeah. Well, so, I mean, you said, uh, you know, you learn more from losses. So that's proof. Uh, if needed, that learning is not always fun, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is important. Right. Um, I was interested, Marlon, so, you know, we moved from, w close enough down here? Mm, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, we <laughs> it's going to be a theme here, people. <laughs> uh, we, mo we moved from, w uh, you know, election night to, you know, when did, when did you, at some point your resolve hardens, because I've talked to you since the election, and, and, you know, it's no longer just about kind of ruminating about wha what could we have done, you know, could we have added some staff here or done so, like, you, you go through the Monday morning quarterbacking, but when do you get to a point where, um, you know, you face a situation as you are as a Democrat in Washington, and you see Republicans in control, and you start to strategize about sort of how you stay relevant, or how do you stay relevant in that kind of a situation? Like Democrat? Yeah. Like me. Um, well, <laughs> yeah. But I don't want to be relevant. Um, <laughs> 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 I'm good. Uh, um, so I think as a party, probably right before inauguration is when you start thinking about like, okay, what, what kind of strategy should we take here, right? Mm -hmm. And then you got to see the moves that are going to happen in order to know how you, as a, as a Democrat, um, engage in, you know, what's known as the resistance. Um, uh, for me personally, I went to, so I got married in December 2014 and then uh, moved us to Brooklyn in March of 2015. So that was a very quick turnaround. <laughs> um, so we didn't really take a honeymoon. So we went to South Africa for about three weeks after the election, which was planned uh, mm -hmm. before the loss and became way more important after the loss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that was, for me, speaking personal for a second, it was extremely important perspective to mm -hmm. see a country that has gone through a lot uh, of turmoil where um, my wife's Caucasian. So 20 years ago, we would have been a legal couple um, uh, in South Africa, more a little more than 20 years ago. Uh, so to see how and to feel the vibe on the ground from the people, how they're trying to push forward. Right. Um, I came back to the states saying, okay, at the end of the day, and I truly believe this, um, uh, the power will always be with the people. And sometimes a fight is going to be extremely hard. Um, but I think all the, what I call positive change in this country, particularly on the social justice front, has happened because people rose up, <laughs> spoke up, organized, uh, and push your elected officials to act. It wasn't because people got in office and was like, I'm going to go do this good thing. It's because people uh, gave pressure. So uh, right around the inauguration, I think for me, that started, you know, started figuring out how we could do this. And that's why I think the party, uh, what I'll call the movement, uh, started to think about what's next. And you start to think you're starting to see that play out. Yeah. Uh, so here's a question I have yeah. for both of you uh, Has the 2016 campaign actually ended? And like by that I mean last night I you know, Johanna can tell you I was line editing a story about Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton arguing with each other at about eleven o'clock last night, a and um, I'm curious if either one of you are surprised at the degree that 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 election is still being kind of litigated or talked about three months. Uh, you know we're now three months into President Trump's tenure. Who's going first? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'm, um, you know, after the election happened, I know Marlon was uh, so deeply involved, I as he knows, you know, we had moved out to California and we were kind of in a little bubble. Um, uh, so, you know, I remember doing a, a, like, Millennials Don't Suck podcast <laughs> that I had been asked to do. And um, I said... Millennials when came up with the title. They did. Years. It was Millennials who, it was Millennial Podcasts. Um, but they were asking me, you know, what do you think about this? And I said, well, I'm never going to root against a United States, pres a president of the United States. So I'm going to root for him to succeed. And I guess, you know, what I'm most frustrated with right now in respect to, you know, us continuing the campaign is when you win, what you're supposed to do or what I feel like we did is that you become, you know, the 
the bigger person or you know you stop debating those things and start thinking about what's best for America and um, I'd say that President Trump is unique in that perspective that he continues <laughs> that uh, debate with Secretary Clinton who I think the question came to her and she answered versus her you know continuing to go forward but that's you know my perspective um, so yeah so let me preface this by I'm biased I also keep it real um, real what I feel is real I think that um, two things are at I think the 2016 election is over for most people I will say two things mm -hmm. um, moving forward one is it's clearly not over for President Trump I think if Mitt Romney did an interview in 2012 discussing the election because someone asked him questions. You would have never seen President Obama tweet or respond to those questions. He was, you know, he, he was busy being president. Well, there was a picture of them hugging in the Oval Office <laughs> after the election, <laughs> or pro hugging, right. not like a full it hug. Not a full yeah. hug, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, the second, and I apologize in advance, um, but I think the media has an obsession with. Um, wanting to hear very specific things come out of Hillary Clinton's mouth mm -hmm. um, and versus her saying we didn't run a perfect campaign which you know newsflash no campaign is perfect um, and also thinking which I agree with that there are some factors that hurt her at the end of the election um, and when a reporter asks you that <laughs> you're gonna as Hillary Clinton you should answer however you feel um, and then the response from the media that I saw on social media um, on her personal analysis of what happened is what keeps the 2016 election alive. She was there to do an event about women and the reporter asked a different question and she responded and now you have to write a story last night, right? So um, I think President Trump keeps it going. I think uh, uh, the media, some media, not all media, uh, keeps it going. I think um, I got a chance to see her a couple weeks ago at Georgetown, um, and I think she's at, um, you know, her own piece about what happened is ready to, to do good in the world again, um, and I hope uh, our current president will focus on doing good as well. I, I often tell this story, Marlon, and I don't even know if we've talked about this, but I talk about, you know, when I came out as a Democrat to my Republican family, and they asked me, but you don't like Hillary Clinton, do you? And this was years ago. And, um, you know, for years she has had a reputation that so many people don't know her. And then I got to meet her and work with her, and um, I found her to be incredibly warm and actually remind me uh, sub significantly of my Republican grandmother who cares most about kids and education and things um, that, that really fuel her um, were similar in many cases to what's fueled Hillary Clinton's real passion for what she does. Um, you worked very closely with her. Can you kind of give us some insight on, you know, who she is to a lot of people, you know, will never get to meet her. I have a great story to, that I always use to explain who she is. Um, one, she's smart. Two of the smart peop people I ever met were, are Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. Um, I will, you probably were in the same situation. We'd be in the White House with a meeting with the president on health care and you present something and he asks you a question, you'd be like, damn it, why'd you ask me that question? Uh, <laughs> I don't know the answer. Why are you so smart? Um, uh, These are things Marlon and, and Johanna never say about CJ's questions, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I read your office, I'm like, mm, no. <laughs> uh, but she's, she's super smart. Um, she is um, passionate about women and girls passionate about a lot of things, but particularly women and girls and um, women and girls. Um, my, she's, you know, um, what's the word I want to use? She's, when she has a goal, she does everything she can to meet that goal, That's which I fantastic. think um, uh, the, some of the misogyny we've seen around the election, mm -hmm. um, if that were a man doing that, mm -hmm. there'd be a lot of difference around it. 
Um, but my favorite attribute about her is that she's super caring. And my story around that is um, in 2015, um, all of you probably remember the uh, uh, murderer in Charleston um, and the nine people who lost their lives at the hand of a racist. Um, she actually was in Charleston that day, flew out about four o'clock to go to Las Vegas for campaigning, and then about uh, seven o'clock is when the incident happened. Um, so I, I know from hearing people who were with her, she was very distraught, right? I was like, she was just, you were just there uh, in the city. Uh, next morning, our whole campaign is like mentally and emotionally not in a great place because it's like, what is happening in our country? Uh, I'm definitely not in a good place, particularly as an African-American uh, male. And uh, my phone rings from a number I don't know, which I usually never answer, um, like most people in this room. I was like, someone told me to answer, and I answer it. And it's Huma, and Huma's like, oh, Marlon, great, hold on a second. And all of a sudden I hear, Marlon's Hillary. I was like, what? <laughs> um, and she just called to say that she was thinking of me, because I was the one, the s most senior African American on the campaign. Um, she wanted me to be a leader for the rest of our community on the campaign. Um, and um, knows that we as a campaign need to really like this can't stand in this country and like how do we as a campaign respond to that and when am I help to figure that out. Uh, but then went back to again, most importantly, I just want to make sure you're okay and if you need anything, let me know. Um, we, we work together obviously a lot, right? I got a chance to travel with her and do a lot of things. We're, um, I didn't call her often. <laughs> uh, so that call doesn't happen very often, yeah, right? The principal right. does not. The principal does not yeah. just call, right? And so, um, and it wasn't like. Maybe, maybe President Clinton, but not right. Secretary Clinton. <laughs> Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's a yes, folks. <laughs> but she knew, she just, in her heart, had empathy and assumed how I felt and reached out without hearing, like, oh, Marlon's having a bad day. She just did it. Um, and that's the kind of person she is. She was also, I think, um, I was expecting, because of her reputation that totally preceded, I expected her to have very like to know exactly what she wanted and she would be like so you know hard core and I found her to actually be one of the easiest people to work with especially because we worked with a lot of the secretaries and she's the secretary of state when we were traveling around the world she's not sleeping at all mm -hmm. she's on flights trying to bring about peace in various countries that are under fire all the time and she would be nice to the press, which is like that's not true. Yes, she no. was. Maybe. Yes, she was. I was there. I was there, and I can tell you that every <laughs> time, like, I would need to move them through. She's like, "Oh yeah, no problem. Hey, how are you guys?" Uh, she was not what I ever expected, and so I wonder. You know, Sherilyn, who I hope comes back to the Dole Center. She's m wonderful. If she comes back to the Dole Institute. You must meet her. She's actually from the Bush administration, so we'll talk later. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, we were talking about how do women become lightning rods? Why do women become lightning rods? And do you agree with that sentiment? Because I see it now happening, I feel like, with Ivanka in kind of an unfair way, I think. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's just, it's the, this society, if you're a woman who strives to be, um, a leader mm -hmm. uh, in the public sphere, um, you were viewed as uh, overstepping. You're viewed as, um, you know, angry, right? Mm -hmm. uh, all these words. Um, and then to your point, when you get to know, I'm using her as an example, when you get to know Secretary Clinton, um, again, she's one of the most caring people I know, right? And mm -hmm. she listens, too. She actually doesn't, she, she will speak, but she mostly listens, and she always asks, how are you doing? Um, and so I think that is um, much like I th racism is still a stain in this country, and I don't think this country has publicly dealt with it in a way that's going to really move us forward. I think you can say the same for sexism. It is a, um, it is a stain in this country and in lots of parts of the world, ob obviously, still. Um, and until we call that out um, and call BS when we see someone get treated that way, um, you know, it's going to continue. And... What's happened in the past 24 hours, while there has been a lot of reporters, I think, doing something that is um, uh, inaccurate, um, I have seen a lot of people also stand up and be like, 
there's more vocalness about that. There's no reason, like, she's not running for president, right? <laughs> right? There's no right. reason for her to get um, treated in that way. Yeah. Um, can I, uh, I, I want to take it, like, back a step and talk a little bit about, um, you know, de Democrats more broad, uh, we'll move on from the 2016 sure. campaign and talk about how do you, you know, we've seen President Trump takes up a lot of oxygen, right? Uh, he's a very big presence, mm -hmm. bigly. Uh, I well, you guys are, yeah, I mean, the press also focuses a lot on Donald Trump okay. and lets him lead the discussion, but this yes, he does. This will not turn into a roast <laughs> of the press. This, dynamic right this here. will this not turn into a roast of the I'm press. I'm telling okay. you. I may just be quiet and watch this. Mar Marla, how do, how do <laughs> Democrats keep their, um, how do you not lose an agenda when Republicans control the White House, control the Senate, control Congress? How do you keep your ideas at the forefront or fight for, you know, like, you know, continue to fight the good fight? Like, how do you keep your ideas yeah. out there? I think anytime, well, I also, I think it's easier, I'm not saying it's the right thing to do, but I do think it's easier to organize against something than for something, mm -hmm. right? Look at Republicans, um, party writ large at the past eight years about the Affordable Care Act, right? Big government, X, X, Y, Z, very easy messaging, right? Now they're in charge and they failed once. I, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, again, personally, that they fail again with the, uh, whatever it's called, AHCA, um, because it's hard to govern. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just think it's most, much easier to be against something than it is for something. Um, I think where we've been successful so far that we have to keep doing and, and take it to the next level is We've used a lot of their um, pushing of legislation to also get our message out, right? right? So they're trying to push forward the uh, American Health Care Act. We have used it to say why the ACA is working, needs to be fixed, but it's working, mm -hmm. right? Um, they, the government was getting ready to shut down. We were able to increase funding to the NIH when, you know, a month ago, uh, President Trump was saying, let's zero it out, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we have to keep using those moments to get our message out. Um, and we can't be, what, I, what irritated me as, as a, um, first a citizen, then a Democrat, uh, then a uh, employee of the White House, was the Republican, um, the DC Republicans at that time were the party of no. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can't be the party of no, we have to be the, um, we don't think this is right, but here's an alternative solution. So here's my question though, Opposition worked for them, right? It, it allowed Republicans to perform, you know, essentially um, block a lot of legislative priorities that they would be principally against. Um, is Democrats in my lifetime have not? Um, they don't always seem as tactically adept at stopping the other the other party's agenda. Mm -hmm. Is that? Um, uh, like, how do you re how do you reconcile that? Because I I'm, I mean I remember at the beginning of the um, the Obama administration uh, when they had super when Democrats had super majorities in both houses, Republicans just basically um, you know uh, Eric Cantor in the House led a you know a pretty staunch resistance to anything President Obama wanted to do, and it was very effective. And by the midterm elections, it was reaping you know that and a combination of Democratic policies not polling particularly well w was reaping results in House races, and therefore Republicans had a foothold and were, were um, ha you know, isn't there some temptation to mimic tactics here, I guess is my question? Uh, yes, and I think you're seeing that a little bit, but I think, again, I think it needs to be um, not just a no, mm -hmm. right? So, again, I think th the budget deal is the best example right now, in my opinion, where the Senate Democrats held together Mm -hmm. Um, and because of that, um, again, the, the shutdown would have been on the Republicans' hands. So because of that, um, there were some priorities that Democrats and others believe help the American people, such as funding health, um, that were able to get a part of the budget deal. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think tactically speaking, I don't think that we've done that that well in the past, but I think yeah. tactically speaking, we started to see that, and I think hopefully we will, we can keep that going. So one of the lessons here is that in a when you're in the minority, unity is a really important thing, right? Yeah. When you're in the majority too, well, by the sure. way, because <laughs> we wouldn't have gotten the Affordable Care Act passed without. And this is my thing. I agree with you. Like the Affordable Care Act is not perfect. Um, you know, I 
I talk about like the extreme cost of health care if you're a 57 year old or something like that and you're looking and you haven't had to pay for your health insurance and you're an entrepreneur but you know if, if President Obama would have done nothing if the Democrats would have done nothing it was it was a situation I think it was what every 30 or 30 seconds someone was going bankrupt so it's like you know th to get the ACA passed every single Democrat had to do that because the Republicans wouldn't come to to any consensus and I think to your point you know as a citizen I get most frustrated with that because I do think that people from every party have solutions and boy wouldn't it be nice if people would actually discuss those solutions instead of just standing against each other's party yes <laughs> all right well I'll just leave you two to it figure it out <laughs> That's um, it. okay no, we'll, we'll get a nice group of Republicans and Democrats right here in Kansas we'll discuss the uh -huh. <laughs> solutions and then present it so <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll put this question to both of you what do Democrats need to do to regain power or some portion of power over the next 18 t months to two years when we have midterm elections well, so um, it, I agree, like, we can't just resist. We have to actually stand for something because I think going back to President Obama and, and actually, you know, how Trump got elected, I think um, he was terrifically negative in ways, but people who were devoted to him were actually hopeful for change because their situation wasn't work. So, like, th their situation wasn't working. So I think you actually do need to inspire hope in anything that you do. So what I, you know, think we need to do is uh, back to the, you know, um, priorities of our party. What do we stand for? We stand for an inclusive, um, you know, clean technology uh, economy that works for the working class as much as it does um, those who are innovators and leading the economy stand for something. And I think that we see those leaders in our parties who are standing for something will hopefully jump into races and then we can support them over time. Um, I know in, in California there's a number of organizations that are uh, popping up um, trying to support funding all sorts of different races, which is important. But um, we also need people in all of these various states to, to really stand up, right? I, I agree. We have to stand for something. People in this country right now um, vote on emotion, right? In 2008, uh, the emotion was hope and change uh, and a, a positive vision. Um, in 2016, even though more people voted for Hillary, um, the emotion was fear. And, um, you know, uh, everything's terrible, I'm going to fix it. Uh, and that, for a lot of people, hit, right? Like, I need somebody to go in and shake it up. And I'm scared, I'm scared about where our country's going. I need somebody to go in and shake it up. Um, so it's easy to do. It's not easy, but you, it's easier to resist mm -hmm. and to say, no, uh, that can't be the way. Uh, it's much harder to articulate what you stand for. And so we had to get on our side a very clear, concise message on what that is and use every opportunity to really push that out. So there is a very clear alternative um, to the American people. And I think if we do that, we'll be successful in the midterms, but also successful in 2020. Are there internal problems within the Democratic Party that make achieving that unified message harder? Um, we've seen over the 2016 election, we saw, um, I think, a, a primary that was like, su in some ways, surprisingly competitive to, s to some people um, between uh, Senator Sanders and Secretary Clinton. Are you worried about Democrats kind of, either of you, worried about Democrats sort of uniting um, as we get closer to midterms or as we look at 2020 and beyond? I'm, I'm worried about any anybody uh, who puts, um, who cannot bend off certain issues. And what I mean by that is um, I think there's extremes of both parties. Mm -hmm. And when you have blinders on and can't compromise, um, that worries me. So obviously there was, like you said, competitive primary in 2016 on the Democratic side. Um, not surprised to us. We expected someone to come in and compete in the sure. primary. Um, but what was, what was, I think, again, as a citizen first, what was disheartening 
was there were some, not a lot, but there were some people who after that primary um, did not thought, you know, they thought Hillary Clinton was too conservative or she wasn't progressive enough. When you actually, if you looked at the plans, um, her plans and Bernie's plans were so close, right? And I think some of those people now are like, woo, different than Trump's <laughs> plans. Um, so on either side, I think I, the, the extremism that happens on both sides needs to be moved out of politics because that's not good for governing and getting stuff done. Um, and so, yes, that, that does worry me as we move forward. Um, I do think the surge of energy from the, like, I think you hear about a lot because that's what's happening yeah. on, you know, uh, in the media. I think on the ground and the surge of energy that's actually happening, a random everyday people saying, I'm going to go run for county council or city commissioner or mayor um, is uh, how we're going to start rebuilding our party. And that's what's going to help us be successful in the long yeah. run. I mean, Johanna got herself elected to our son's oversight board. I so did. It, exactly. is, it, is it is my most proud elected <laughs> office. So I'm on the oversight committee for Lockwood Avenue Elementary <laughs> School. But, you know, I, but uh, on, on that point, you know, I think um, a couple things, but I it's really easy to tell people anything they want to hear. Like, yes, we're going to give free college tuition to everyone. That's really easy to say, and th but it's not true. And so, and that's the problem is, okay, where's that money coming from? And so I feel like, you know, both sides of the party, to the, your point, we had that extremes of we can just say whatever we want and we don't actually have to, you know, worry about if it's going to be true or if there's a plan behind it. Um, and I, I talk about this a lot in the terms of the media. I want you guys to lead the discussion and not just follow the politicians mm -hmm. Because if you were, yeah, if you were actually digging into the details of some of these plans, and, you know, I don't know about the Americans' appetite for actually reading about it, but if we actually dig into the details of these plans, maybe some more of that would come to light. And maybe it's going to just by virtue of, you know, uh, President Trump not getting much passed. But um, I hope Americans start paying more attention to the false promises that are being offered. So uh, I want to um, open this up to our audience for questions here very soon. Um, but uh, I wanted to just, Marlon, um, Johanna has talked about this a little bit in her discussion groups, but um, we have a lot of students in the audience who are interested in politics on both sides, some even in the middle, like the last two moderates on planet America <laughs> here. Um, I That's not true. Not so true. <laughs> anyway. Um, I would say that passion for the middle ground as a 19-year-old is a really impressive character trait. <laughs> um, having said that, uh, I just if, do you have like one piece of advice you could give our students, and then we'll turn it over and we can talk about anything about Democrats staying relevant and you know the kind of current condition of American politics. But like, what advice would you give our students or people who are interested in politics? At the um, take yourself back to you know junior junior year of college, Marlon. Like, what you know, what advice would you give? Uh, a couple of things. One is get involved in something. It could be student senate like I did. It could be the grass is green club. It doesn't matter. Um, just get involved in something because what I've learned in politics but really in life is um, I loved class here. Like I, actually, I did like going to class. I learned so much though from getting involved in student organizations because it taught me how to lead because um, uh, I was I had to lead, right? We had to to, to do that. So get involved in something. Um, and then particularly on the political side, um, volunteer. And as, as, as the President Obama said before he left office, just be a good citizen, right? So if you care about something, go out there and knock on doors about it. If you care about something, make some phone calls about it. Um, you don't have to devote your whole every day to it. Um, but do something so you're a part of changing our democracy. Uh, and if we, I, I'm a fan of working on campaigns because I think the skill sets you get working on campaigns are um, incredible and can carry over to any profession that you do, even if you just work on one. Um, so I would push everyone to go do that because it's good. Uh, but most importantly, find a candidate you care about, help them out, uh, an issue you care about, get involved with it, uh, and just be active. Awesome. So uh, I want to turn it over for questions and bonus points if you do not bash the media in your question. Hey, um, now, you don't get to give away bonus <laughs> points. <laughs> Bonus points from me. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, so Marlon, you're a strategist. Uh, what advice would you have to people going um, into messaging and strategy and branding um, to kind of have that unified message that we talked about? I feel like currently in the Republican Party, you know, we have different messages coming out of the White House and agencies and the Speaker's office. Um, and so I guess how do we have that unified message and maybe like in, in both parties, but yeah. specifically in the Republican Party? I think whatever party, uh, the unified message has to, again, touch your heartstrings and hit your emotions. Um, and Johanna said some really good things about the Democratic Party, right? It's, you know, it wants to have an, an economy that uh, is looking forward. It wants um, people to be able to love each other, right? You can name a lot of things that matter. Um, but at the end of the day, I think we're a party that um, wants um, everyday people to be able to get ahead, to stay ahead, right? Um, so something that is that all the little sub messages that you said can all tie up to that something that like pulls on your heartstrings um, is something that I think parties should have, right? I think, look, Trump, again, I think actually had a really powerful message, right? Make America great again, right? Yeah. So if you felt like the, the, you weren't able to get ahead for whatever reason, to just hear something to make America great again, you're like, you know, this guy's gonna try to go in there and mm -hmm. provide. So who doesn't want to do that? Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, so that's what I would say is, um, and then it, it, it takes a lot of discipline to be on message, mm -hmm. um, and so making sure that whoever is speaking to the CJs of the world uh, is always saying whatever, but then finishes their line with. Make America make America America again. I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> the fish in the line with whatever that message is is really important, but it has to it has to touch your emotion. It has to know that um, uh, speak to people that you care. You know, I often tell the story, Marlon, about um, it being early in Iowa with President Obama in 2007. I was a huge fan of his since you know 2000. What was it? 2004 when he gave the convention speech mm -hmm. and he talked about Galesburg, my hometown, and Kansas values and. But in Iowa, people didn't immediately love him. In fact, there was a lot of skepticism. And until he started telling the fired up, ready to go story, we did not see a lot of traction. We would have, you know, events and we'd have people pulled together in hay bales and, uh, and they'd leave the event being like, I don't know, I'm unsure. I don't know whether I'm gonna vote for him. And then he started telling that fired up, ready to go story story about, you know, if one voice can change a room, one voice can change a state, one voice can change a nation, one voice can change this world. Let's go fire it up. That changed the whole campaign. And so it's like we have to regroup and get back to the basics of like what is our story now that we're telling. But, that goes but talking points matter. And, that goes <laughs> and to like repetition part, yeah. to the American people and like Poor President Obama. I mean, I literally sat through like, I mean, five events a day where he would say the same exact <laughs> thing <laughs> over and over and over. That's <laughs> a hallmark of many successful politicians is repetition. repetition. Key, mm -hmm. key to elected office and humor, repetition. <laughs> right. uh, more questions, guys? Hey, how's it going? Hey, so how are you? Good. Uh, so how does going, like, w how does, how does being from KU and like being from like a Midwest culture background like translate into like being suc a successful campaigner slash political operative for you personally? Can we each talk about that? Yeah, that okay. was yeah. also a good <laughs> idea. Yeah. <laughs> no. Evidently. Okay. Yeah, right. Listen, number one, number I, I number one, I grew up in New Jersey, which is not Kansas, uh, very much not. Uh, I came here and I was like confused why people were nice. I'm speaking very well of my home state here. <laughs> uh, people, y y you know, you come here, you're, you're at the dorm, and Ryan, who I went to college with, is here, so he remembers kind of, you know, I was like, <laughs> what is going on? Why are people saying hello? Like, you know, <laughs> what KU taught me was that, um, and uh, as a journalist, and really this would serve me in any profession, being nice, and I don't, and not like, um, not fake nice, but like just genuinely curious about your fellow citizens or your people around you will serve you so well. And um, it's that Midwestern, um, but I associated very like precisely with Kansas and not the, you know, 
how friends at the University of Missouri or something, right? <laughs> but it's like a unique like, kind of friendliness that, um, that I think that you know, being friendly and curious about people that you live and work with um, is always going to serve you well. And that's something that you should absolutely export with you wherever you go from KU. I keep telling you about the mic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I know Marlon has something to say on this, so I'll I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm not from New Jersey. Um, <laughs> no, I'm from St. Louis. I will say that um, being from the West St. Louis, coming to school here, um, there there's very few people I don't get along with because I people here are just like. Uh, you can have a conversation about politics, and it's like okay. You right? can also disagree, and you can disagree, yeah. and it's it's very much more. Um, I don't want to use the word laid back, but I can't think of another word. But it's it's respectful. okay. It's respectful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, like I just I, so I just did what these guys did at Georgetown for the semester, um, where I led a discussion group every week. Um, and I shared the office with Grover Norquist, who was like, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> and it was great. <laughs> Right, we talked about the randomest stuff. Um, <laughs> Shrinking government. <laughs> right no, no. We talked about him going to Burning Man, which is a whole. Oh my God, ex- that's a whole know what Burning experience. Man is like. Think about Grover Norquist going to Burning Man. Anyway. <laughs> uh, like a screenplay. Right, right. <laughs> that happened. Yeah. Okay. Um, but like you know, at the end of the day, the way I think most Midwesterners view it, uh, at least a lot, is um, we may disagree, but we're all just trying to move forward and try to try to make the world better. So, uh, and that's not to say people on the coast don't feel that way, but there's just something special about the Midwest. So that's, that. I feel like I go into a room ready to just have a, a not, I don't like to argue. I just like to have a conversation and figure out how do we get to a common place. I, I agree with that. And it's, um, you know, Kansas is, um, when I was here, of course, I remember my first semester, I bring my, you know, big Al Gore sign and my roommate is like, oh my God, you support Al Gore? <laughs> but, you know, um, being a Democrat in a Republican state was actually probably the best experience for me because you have to really um, know what you stand for and you also know that you're not always right and that you can, you know, compromise and have some perspective. Marlon, when we first got you to come, I was thinking, it wouldn't it be great if we had Kevin Yoder and we could bring him because so Con- uh, Congressman, Congressman Kevin Yoder, Kevin Yoder who so Marlon and I were Democrats in college and it's as it turns out, so was Kevin. <laughs> 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 So when he first ran for Congress, I remember both of us went over and knocked doors for Kevin because we had known him. I think that was the House of uh, State House. Oh, yeah, yeah. Was it State? It was State House. You're right. It was definitely It was not Congress. (laughs) You're right. It was State House. It was his first campaign, and we went over and we knocked doors for him. And I think that um, last night we got to come to these students, had a wonderful reception for the Student Advisory Board. And they were saying how they had made so many friendships with the other side. And I remembered that, um, that we did, you know, pre the Dole Institute really bringing us together. But that, um, you know, would be fantastic if we continued it into uh, politics. And I would love to have Kevin Yoder come back and we can talk to him about all the various things. (laughs) He's he's probably running for governor, so he'll probably be Uh, around. Okay, can Marlon and I bring him back to the Dole Institute? <laughs> okay. More, more <laughs> questions, because that, that was an awesome question. Yeah. There are several things about politics that really irritate me. <laughs> me too. But one of the things that really ticks me off is redistricting mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and all of the gerrymandering that's going on. Mm-hmm. I have heard a little conversation lately about the possibility of the courts taking over redistricting. Do you think that's a possibility? What would have to happen for that to happen? And if it does happen, how long might it take before it does happen? So I think uh, that's a great question. And I completely agree about the, it's, I would put it as one of the top two problems with our political system, number one being our finance laws, Mm -hmm. um, in my opinion. I have not heard that courts would take over redistricting everywhere. 
right now it's basically uh, each state has a little different process. Um, I think Florida has what they call, they passed what's called the fair district laws, which actually requires them to draw fair districts and if not, then the court there can intervene. Um, I do know on the Democratic side there is the, uh, a new organization that President Obama is actually involved with, the National Redistricting Committee, um, that's looking at every state and trying to figure out not just the best ways to make it democratic, but the best ways to make it fair mm. um, across the board. And if that involves um, trying to do ballot measures to make it so uh, the courts are involved in one state, they'll do that. Uh, if that involves litigation, they'll do that. If that involves making sure they, you know, we elect a governor um, who will draw a fair district, they'll do that. So I have not heard that. Um, I do hope that is the place where we go. If, if we have fair districts everywhere, and if something is drawn incorrectly, that courts can intervene. Um, but I think that will be hard to do in the near, near future in all 50 states, but I think that should be a goal for our country. So Johanna and I have had uh, the opportunity to live in two states where, um, you know, each state, as you said, each state has kind of a different, uh, if, they, if they choose to not go the route of letting the legislature draw the lines, each state that has gone the, the nonpartisan route has their own solution. But we've lived in California and Iowa where um, the a now a nonpartisan commission draws district lines. And what, what strikes me is um, in California, um, you have a lot more um, seats that have become competitive. And in Iowa, they actually flip. You know, uh, with the exception of Western Iowa, um, all God, of the Steve King just keeps hanging on, doesn't yeah. he? Well, you know, that guy. Um, all of those, all <laughs> of those seats, um, all those seats have flipped like within the last ten years. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so um, that's proof. If, if if you know, if competition, you know, uh, business people always say competition keeps you sharper, right? So if competition keeps politicians sharper, then Iowa is proof mm -hmm. that um, you know nonpartisan redistricting. Keeps its politicians sharper, I think. More, more questions. Or but it is state by state, yeah. and and I know after the election, when uh, Hillary Clinton had won more votes, you know, I think we were talking with a whole di bunch of different groups, and there's very little that can be done. But they were saying even if it was by congressional district for the uh, like percentages out, it would have been more fairly representative of you know not the popular vote, but of the way different areas were voting. I don't want to bash the media, but it, it's okay. Uh, I was <laughs> <laughs> earlier today. I was listening to Representative Mark Pocan mm -hmm. um, from Wisconsin in the Progressive Caucus, and he said they put together a whole budget plan that has not been reported on. So s word is not getting out about the really good things they're doing and and proposing. So what do you suggest? Yeah. Hey, I was how you doing? Okay. Who, which one of us wants to take this? Uh, I would say um, I'm familiar with with Congressman Pocan's budget proposal, but I, th I, I think in general, m my if if I could use the B word, the bias word as a reporter, what I'm biased toward is is um, uh, like we we have a finite amount of resources and a finite amount of attention span, and I often find myself specifically with policy proposals focused on. Wow, <laughs> Johanna. Okay, <laughs> focused on keeping the microphone close to my lips. Uh, <laughs> focused on things that are that stand a greater chance of becoming law, and at this point, for the reality for me as a reporter, and I think even Marlon would acknowledge this, is that Republicans control the House and Republicans control the Senate, and so legislation that they are working on stands, if not uh, stands, the best chance of becoming law or something that I have to analyze as a, as a reporter or a um, uh, journalist. Well, okay. So I understand, I guess, that perspective. However, it's, uh, we talk about this as well, about, you know, the uh, way you win any campaign or anything with hearts and minds is it's money and oxygen in the sense of getting your message out. And so you guys are getting uh, giving a lot of uh, oxygen to, you know, um, a party that has a slight majority and not even the majority of, you know, the popular vote. So what I would say in terms of our media is I think it's um, flawed based on the financial model that um, needs to, to change, um, especially because, you know, the, the corporate, uh, you know, ownership of uh, media organizations is, is complex, and some decisions that are being made based on, like, clickbait and getting people to look at their site 
are not necessarily what's best for what Americans should be digesting and what we need to be an informed citizenry. Um, I know I feel very strongly about this. Obviously, I left the Obama administration and went to the LA Times when Austin Butner was there. Austin Butner and Eli Broad had actually been talking about turning in that newspaper into a nonprofit, um, which I I do believe is a better model for um, for the news, just in the sense of when you are um, beholden to shareholders and to a board to make profit you have a different priority uh, that I d do believe trickles to your editorial. And I think that we've seen that over the course of time that our journalism has changed um, significantly when you know everything went online and they're competing and they're competing for advertisers with Google and Google has the share like Google has the share mm -hmm. of advertising because it's much more easy to target. And so w in r newspapers losing their budget model, we've really lost the core of reporting, um, which I think is really dangerous to our democracy. So I actually want to see more entrepreneurs try to reinvent this, um, and I'm, I'm pretty passionate about this subject. So I will <laughs> gladly tell my husband anytime <laughs> what I think, and he doesn't always listen. Marlon, you want to follow that? I 1,000% agree <laughs> with everything Johanna just said, and will add that the media, not you, big picture. It's okay. Um, <laughs> treats politics right now you. as a soap opera. Mm -hmm. Or sports. Those and are the two metaphors. I not get. sports. They treat, it they treat it as a soap opera. <laughs> okay. um, and <laughs> until we as a people, as a um, public, stand up and call that out, they will keep doing it. Until we stop giving them our money, mm -hmm. they will keep doing it. And while I disagree with everything the president says about it being fake news and everything he's doing um, to uh, discredit the media, I completely agree it is, the way our system is set up now is based on financial, um, what, what, is, what gets us money, mm -hmm. and soap opera is, is what sells. Mm -hmm. um, and until we as a public say, stop giving us that information and that's not what I should be making my decision on, they will keep doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more, more questions that make me feel hey. good inside. I'll keep it close this is the to thing my actually. mouth. To, to uh, defend journalists, I will oh say. Oh, no, no, you don't need no, to No, 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 okay. but I do, I want to make the distinction that it's actually, like, I've seen it firsthand that I don't actually think it's always the journalists who are making the decisions. Oh, really? That, that actually journalists in, in many cases are thoughtful and um, you know, try to report on something and then you know, some other decision is made on what the headline or what the coverage is going to yeah. be. Well, having been involved you know, with the Obama administration and in government and in the political process, who are new people in the Democratic Party, uh, that's a either great in question. the House or the Senate, that these young people should be following or maybe trying to get internships from or anything like that because that's really the this future. Is, this is top intelligence, so I I'm going to pause. I'm going to get my <laughs> notebook out. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think there's a few that are more higher profile that are newer, right? So um, Senator Kamala Harris in California is, I think, fantastic and um, has a bright future in our party. Um, I think you've seen uh, Adam Schiff really get out there and, and be a face of um, uh, the resistance in terms of how he's been pushing back against Trump, same with Senator Murphy uh, in Connecticut. Um, so that's a couple of, and you should definitely chime in, that's a couple of kind of the national ones. I, I'm a big fan of local politicians, because at one, I think that's where um, a lot of things that affect everyday people happen. Uh, but two, I think that's where the next rising stars are in our party. Um, so I don't know if he'll do anything after this, but like I'm a huge fan of Mayor James in Kansas City, which is local. Uh, Sly James in Kansas City, Mayor of Kansas City. Mm -hmm. um, he's a great mayor. He's a great person. He's helped me out just a lot just with advice of, about life. Um, uh, I think he's amazing. Personal and biased, but I think he's amazing. And so I think looking at um, mayors, state elected officials, like state reps, right? So 
good friend of mine named Mike Blake, who's now the vice chair of the DNC. Um, Blake is great. He's we a state representative in, in the Bronx in New York. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a, a bright future mm -hmm. uh, in our party. Uh, and, and there's a lot of these folks out there, and I'm happy to, th both of us are happy to generate yeah. some names and email them out to everyone. Cause Who's some the some congresswoman from Hawaii who I'm, uh, I've heard Have she's interesting. Together? Have you met her? Because I have not met her. So but I've heard that she's interesting. There's a mayor from Indiana that a bunch of people are Pete big fans of. Pete Buttigieg. Yeah. Uh, he's the mayor of South Bend. Yeah. Um, Jason I Kander, who ran for office. Yeah. 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 I, I love Jason Kander. He ran for mm -hmm. Senate in Missouri. I'm also, you know, particularly interested in women and trying to see um, women succeed in politics of all backgrounds. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the things that, that you see is um, I, I believe we need to promote more women because I, I think there's Kirsten uh, Gillibrand um, is one woman, uh, Kamala, you already mentioned there. Um, there are uh, a number of women who we have not probably brought up, but I, I did hear great things about the congresswoman. And isn't there someone from Arizona that people have told me about? Well, there are people from Arizona. No, 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 no. Hey, I got to get it. Hey, <laughs> you're the <laughs> reporter. <laughs> you beat me up for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, one last person is, um, I think she announced today, so there's, um, the House Minority Leader in Georgia, Stacey Abrams, oh yeah, mm -hmm. announced Stacey. that she's running for governor. If elected, she would be the first African American woman to serve as governor in the history of the United States, not in the history of Georgia, in the history of the United States. So, yeah. oh, John Ossoff, um, mm -hmm. he was uh, a couple years ago like um, uh, chief of staff or staff director or something on the House, and now he's running for the House. So. A lot of good young that names out there. That's a very competitive race, and uh, I, a question I didn't get to when we were talking. But um, are you see like, are we seeing Democratic, uh, you know, revival in these House races? Which we've had one here in Kansas uh, a runoff where, um, you know, the Democrat didn't win but ran ran someone very close here, um, and in Georgia, uh, you know, a, a House seat that hasn't been competitive in almost my lifetime. I feel like. Uh, is is now like a you know wire to wire race? Uh, do do those give you hope when you yeah, look at those I have things? Yeah, I have a lot of hope for the party moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, one, I think you're just seeing a lot of energy out there. But two, again, doing a similar discussion group at Georgetown and hearing from young students about their vision, where they want the country to go, and how people want to get involved, and the thousands of people who've signed to run for something, mm -hmm. that brings me the most hope. Um, and I think. Well, I'm, I'm hopeful for 18. What I think we have to do is we too often organize in presidential cycles. Mm -hmm. And we need to organize, period, um, and always have something that is sustaining, that is out there, that is pushing you know, to elect politicians that represent us or to push the elected politicians to represent us mm -hmm. if they're already elected. Um, we're not there yet. Actually, I don't think we been in that good space for a while as Democrats. We've, presidential election, let's organize, right? And unless we keep sustaining and are out there leaving a conversation like this and going out there and re registering five voters, um, then uh, we'll keep doing the ebbs and flows of what history has told us. Well, and I think that, right, I, for a number of reasons, I mean, you mentioned the money in politics. To run a race, it costs so much. It takes so much time. A lot of people, you know, don't want to put themselves out there and be very vulnerable, even they, though they would be fantastic in politics. And so I think you're right. We have to, like, reinvent um, a lot of the systematic barriers that have kept um, people who really should be in office but uh, may not have necessarily um, wanted to put themselves through that uh, that political uh, minefield um, to get them into elected office. And so it's easier in a place, you know, in Kansas where the financial barriers are not the same as California to run a race in California. It's like you have to raise enough money for a national race. You had to raise versus money for your little school. Right? I, did, I, did, I didn't. I didn't, actually. <laughs> I was really grateful for your vote, though, CJ. <laughs> I'm not. Uh, I'm a journalist. I'm nonpartisan. <laughs> but if my wife tells... No.
Um, but yeah, uh, the other thing, after President Obama spoke in Chicago, um, you know, I was talking to a reporter and they were saying, isn't it too bad that all of the, you know, Obama legacy is going to be dim like gone with Trump? And I said, that's so far from the truth because you have all of these people who joined his campaign and who have been part of this world for, you know, now a, a decade who are just going back into various communities who I believe, you know, them along with, um, you know, young, uh, young people of all uh, stripes are going to be our future. And so I actually think um, he's the communi community organizer who's taught us so well that um, the best of the Democratic Party is ahead of us and not behind us. So uh, I've got time. We've got time for a few more questions. I would also just like to say, as a reporter, excellent questions today, guys. <laughs> like really provocative, <laughs> interesting questions. Yeah. Oh, oh, Keith's got a question. Well, yeah. Cody. Yeah, Cody. You get <laughs> after this may not be one. <coughs> anyway, after a oh. hundred days. What would you, would you take a shot in the dark and predict what's going to happen in the Trump administration? Mm. <laughs> I, I think that. You guys can definitely predict. Yeah. 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 Um, Go ahead. I'm with Johanna. Like, you always want the president, regardless of the party, to be successful. I think, I don't know if he will be, and I would, I would, I would bet right now he won't be as successful as he would like to be, um, uh, as he probably would tell you himself. Um, and I think both that's because of, as he said, governing is hard, and it was a lot harder than he thought it was going to be. But I think um, almost as important is the, um, the f fissure that exists within the Republican Party, which we are seeing play out in healthcare, right? They try to make the health care bill a little bit more conservative, and the moderates are like, no. And then they try to make it a little bit more moderate, and the conservatives are like, no. And I can see almost every issue having that bounce back and forth um, uh, in the House. I think it's going to be really, really hard. My, honestly, my biggest worry about the Trump administration is what they do with regulations um, in the, and just through the administration, which they can just do. Um, and I think that is – there's already things happening that don't get talked about that much because – they're talking about the soap opera. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just something that I think we, as a public, got to keep our eye on. And um, that as we continue to, to resist from our side is call that out and make sure that we know what's happening. So when we do take back the White House, we're ready to um, change that back to things that help people. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know if you saw the tweet that, um, it, was it a rabbi who was standing with uh, Steve Bannon mm. in front of, a, of the checklist of his first 100 days that, that, you know, he had check marks on what was accomplished and what was not accomplished, um, which I found fascinating because, you know, to see someone's board like that was like, oh, even the <laughs> scoreboard, I mean, huh? Even the I'm looking at you guys keeping track. But even the handwriting, you can learn some things from when you see this very like detailed handwriting, you know? <laughs> I, I mean, scary. seriously. No. He's, he's well, a little I'm scary. Okay. <laughs> well, I will. I'll say I think Hard he's pass. a little scary. <laughs> well, I just, you know, I want good people in politics. I don't care, you know, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, but people who care about their family and people who, and so, you know, it's someone who just like looks at the outside of the stories about the ex-wives and the, so it's, it's a lot of like, oh dear. But um, regarding like what he's actually, actually accomplished, even on his uh, checklist, I would say that um, I, we talked about this a lot about moving the goalposts. So they may say, "Check, we've drained the swamp because we've, you know, um, pot, you know, put a freeze on on federal, uh, you know, hiring." But then, oh, actually, unintended consequences. Turn that back on. They'll they'll play it in front of the media. He's like a master marketer, so he's going to play it in front of the media. Like they've gotten a lot of these things done. Um, and in you know, truth, some things like are you know um, changing. But what what I what I am cognizant of is um, we've we've now set him up for such low expectations that when he reads from a teleprompter he's presidential um, and I think that's a detriment because he's the president of the United States and he does have a lot of power 
So, you know, where he has said different things, I think we need to, you know, be very cognizant to pay attention to what he's doing. Is that the right thing for the country? You know, on immigration in particular, I think Rob Kaplan was fascinating when he came back here. Um, he's the president of the Fed, and he's also a Jayhawk in Dallas. In, in Dallas. Yeah, and he's a uh, Jayhawk, and he was talking about, you know, the entitlements that um, we need to support. And he was saying, actually, if we don't have, you know, vast, uh, better, uh, vastly better laws on immigration and allowing immigrants, we won't be able to support the economic um, successes that we need to support the baby boomers who are retiring. So, you know, I think um, whether Trump is successful on his little checklist of the first 100 days doesn't necessarily set us up for the success that we need for this country. And so I'm hopeful that we as an American people can start like our checklist of what that, you know, future needs to look like and hold ourselves, you know, accountable to all of those different things. And, and my prediction, because reporters did a lot of predicting and it did not go well for them the past year, is that my prediction is that no prediction I could give you would be correct, <laughs> except that President Trump will tweet again and I will have to deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, President Obama recently took uh, $400,000 from a series of companies. I personally don't have any problem with it. Um, but the people that did seem to have a problem with it um, were from the liberal spectrum. It wasn't, wasn't the Republicans. I mean, it was Bernie Sanders. It was Elizabeth Warren. It was that kind of folk. My question is, does that kind of shine a light on the future of the Democratic Party if, if you have a president who, by a lot of objective terms, had a very successful presidency, never running for another office in his life and is now going around giving speeches and earning money. Um, does it shine a light on the future of the Democratic Party that any involvement in Wall Street is going to be demonized in a way? Uh, and does that show deeper cracks in kind of the future of the, of the party? Thank you. Uh, great question. No, I think it shines a light on people who have idealistic views and cannot move off of them. Um, Today, I think he also announced that he was given like $2 million to uh, invest in some things in Chicago um, that will help young people of color. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I saw an article that uh, he's invested a lot of money. So one, who knows what he's doing with this money? Two, who knows what he's gonna say? He may take the money and be like, well, y'all need to change your, hmm. <laughs> um, uh, And three, we should want people to be successful and, and that's never, it's never not wanting about not wanting people to be successful, is that we want to make sure that there's a level playing field for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the majority of the party, uh, as evidenced actually by, by the primaries, um, feel that way uh, and will continue to um, uh, be successful on that point. So uh, it's just another case, again, what highlights to me idealism on both sides without people being able to see or have a conversation about um, what's possible. Well, and that's the, the whole thing is uh, he's not getting paid for every speech. He, in fact, said himself that he was going, it, it was Eric Schultz commented on this and said, you know, he's giving all sorts of different speeches. But, you know, when a group is paying for him, he is worth a premium. He is a former president and the first African-American president that our country has ever had. So I, I don't think it's unfair at all for him to charge market value for his services. Um, so I, I think we all wish our market value was <laughs> I wish comparable. my, yeah, I mean, that would be a phenomenal. <laughs> but like, yeah. look at the athletes that are making a heck of a lot more for just going out on a field. Um, President Obama has a lot to say. He's always had a lot to say. I always have enjoyed listening to it. And so I hope he does and continues to do both paid and unpaid speeches um, so that we can have that contribution to our society. So I think we have time for, uh, and this brings one tear rolling down my cheek, just like one or two more questions. I know two we more. have two more. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> oh, okay. Um, so with papers for classes, we have to focus on like the other opposite side of the argument and rebuttal that. But I don't see that in the media. It's very one-sided. When do you expect to see that, or will that happen? Or Interesting. That's a great question. Mm. Thanks, Marlon. <laughs> Thank you. That is a thoughtful question. I, um, as a reporter, 
m one of my principal um, goals is always to represent both sides of an issue. Um, sometimes that doesn't always take the form of a, of a rebuttal. And by that I mean um, if Marlon gives a speech about um, you know Democrats in uh, you know Democrats hopes in 2018, and there are no um, there are no Republicans there to kind of counter his his viewpoint. My job is to cover the speech, and right now we have a problem. Mm. It's not a problem. Mm. Uh, it's a situation where Republicans control a lot of levers of power, and sometimes when you read an article about a healthcare fight, it's this internecine thing where. Republicans are arguing amongst themselves about a health care bill, and for the most part, um, a Democrat isn't relevant to that conversation unless the vote margins get really strange or politics get kind of turned on this. Um, but, it, it, you know, whether it's your, your coursework or my reporting, I always feel like the best, you know, the best way to make your case or to inform the public, which is my job, is to make sure that all sides are represented. Um, I... Uh, you know, Johanna and I think Marlon have both read enough of my journalism to know that I try to be studiously fair um, or err on the side of a corny joke. <laughs> um, but and I, I think that that is, uh, you know, I, I, I know Johanna's going to reply here and say that she, I can anticipate it. <laughs> so I'm going to try to filibuster here because we only have yeah, two more. Yeah, you guys are married or something. <laughs> I think that especially, uh, I would say this, uh, especially when one party is in total control of um, the levers of power in, in government, it's incumbent upon the press not just to represent their views, but to also, you know, always, whether that's minority communities, minority parties, to represent all as many different viewpoints and pieces of the spectrum as you can. And that's how you become a better, more informed society and how you fulfill your really important job as a journalist. Journalism has always been flu flawed in the sense of, you know, if you even look back at, you know, th I was I do some research and uh, LA libraries give us access to all these archive newspaper databases. And I'm looking through and it's like, you know, for a long time, only a certain segment of our population had any representation in the media and it was white men. And so, you know, and, I, and now um, you're seeing, you know, different silos of media. So for your, for your paper, I would actually suggest you could actually look at Breitbart for one perspective and probably something like Huffington Post for an entirely different perspective because we're now living in two different silos of these universes, which is too bad. So um, I do think it's actually the job of, you know, our, um, our media to give us, you know, all sides of this per perspective, but they have never been perfect on it. And I think that it's uh, our job as a z citizenry to keep uh, telling them to push forward on this and when there are new perspectives to bring those to light. I wish they would engage more. Um, in fact, that's one of the things that we were trying to do when, you know, we were talking about the LA Times was more engagement with our community and listening versus just deciding in a room what you were going to write and then calling like three people mm -hmm. who worked into your story and placing them in the story. And so I know CJ and I actually did go talk to the students at the Kansan and said, this is your test bubble. You guys should be doing this. Um, and my hope is that we can keep um, the evolution of media going into a hopefully better place than it has been in the past. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no pressure here, but this is, this is the last question of our discussion group. Ever. <laughs> ever. <laughs> I need Jesse Burbank up here to give me the voice of God ever. I know. He's <laughs> Marlon, you earlier mentioned that you felt like campaign finance was the most serious problem facing our election system right now. Uh, what do you think is the most effective strategy to address that problem, and what is the most effective advocacy organization out there facing or addressing that problem now? Excellent, thoughtful question to end on. Um, I like your beard, by the way. I usually <laughs> I have beards during campaigns, <laughs> and um, so I appreciate beards. Um, I think the most effective way of addressing campaign finance is to start changing our laws at the state and local level. Um, 
what I found, again, with big change in this country is that it starts happening locally first, right? And then, again, it kind of just bubbles up where the federal government has to do something about it. In many cases, not all cases, but in many cases. And so I think the more that we are um, switching these laws and being very public about it in Kansas, in Missouri, in um, New Jersey, right? The more that we're <laughs> doing that. <laughs> Why should pick New Jersey? Uh, <laughs> no comment. New Jersey's um, corruption in politics uh, is like <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> hello. Uh, but the more that we're doing that um, and start picking off states one by one and localities one by one, then I think the federal government will be um, kind of forced to act. Um, so that's the first thing I'll say is change laws locally and then pressure through organizing uh, and political pressure of the federal government to act. And so I don't think it's a quick fix, unfortunately, uh, but I do think it's one that uh, is possible uh, in, in this country. In terms of the best organizations that are working on this, wow. Um, there, I mean, I'm gonna give credit where credit's due. Bernie is a champion about campaign finance. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's something that he's really passionate about. I don't follow the work of our revolution that much, but I imagine that's a place you can uh, check out and um, get involved in that. I think there's a lot of organizations that, um, you know, uh, whether it be the NAACP or National Council of La Raza, um, while their big fight is, you know, civil rights, I think you, this to me is a, a right, and so that's, it, it kind of falls in there. There's a lot of organizations that do some of this work. Um, uh, do you have any organizational thoughts? I was thinking, you know, the the reality is you play by the the game rules um, as they are and not as they should be. So, you know, in the sense of people criticize the Obama campaign a lot because we ended up um, taking, you know, big dollar contributions, but we had to because everybody else was. So I agree with you, Marlon, in the sense of, you know, the states being a test bubble would be really interesting, but then the media dynamic is so important in it that that conversation, you know, needs to be part of it because whether they're paying for ads or whether they're getting free airtime, um, that can make a big difference in uh, local races. Um, but I don't know, you know, the, the specific organizations that I would recommend on this yet. I'm sure they will form and I'm sure that we will uh, know of them, but um, when they aren't out there, you know, I kind of feel like that's the opportunity for us to create. So right here in Kansas, you guys <laughs> can do it. All right, well, here we are. That is, th this brings a close to our discussion group. Before uh, Johanna and I go, I would really like to um, thank uh, Bill Lacey, uh, Dole Institute's director, for giving us this opportunity to come home and do this. It's been kind of, I thought it would be awesome, and it has been in a lot of ways more awesome than I could have imagined. I would like to thank all the um, students that we've gotten to get to know and work with on the um, awesome student advisory board here, and particularly Alex and Emily, who have been our sort of, um, uh, you know, I don't know how, I, I, they Shepherd? shepherds <laughs> is the word that's coming to mind. <laughs> <laughs> I um, don't know. <laughs> you know, um, Alex and Emily are freshmen at KU, and um, they have just such big things ahead of them, uh, but they always manage to find time to deal with Johanna and I's unique brand of crazy every time we come. And it's been awesome. And I want to thank you, Marlon, for being here for our last discussion group mm -hmm. and all of you for participating. It's been an awesome semester. Thank you so much. That's true. Oh. Can I tell a quick story? <laughs> yeah. I paid for this microphone. No, I, w I was going to say, you know, the other thing that I just want to say is to all of you who came to multiple of our discussions, your familiar faces in the audience was so warming, and we are really grateful mm -hmm. for your continued participation. So. Yeah. Real quick story. <laughs> uh, no, it's good. It's deep. I love KU. Okay, first of all. Um, <laughs> So I have to leave like literally right after this because I have to go catch a plane because uh, I'm going to Dallas. A friend of mine passed away yesterday. And the reason I bring that up is he got insurance through the ACA because he was unemployed in January, uh, about a week actually before he fell ill. Um, and so therefore his, he was capped in terms of how much he has to spend on 
uh, health insurance. Um, and I don't say that to say, yay, ACA, though I feel that way, or for you to have empathy right now, but I say it because it is another reminder to me and a, um, about what should be priorities in our life and what politicians should really focus on and why it matters. And so going back to my point about getting involved no matter what, um, we need to hold our politicians and also our media accountable that this is not a soap opera, it's not a game, it actually affects people's lives. And the fact that like his parents are not have to worry now about you know, hundreds and thousands of dollars of medical bills uh, when they're trying to think about other things is something that's really, really important. So if there's anything you take away from this conversation, but also just what these guys have done all semester um, and just about politics is that it does matter uh, and it matters to people and we need to make sure that we're holding our elected officials accountable uh, to that in our media so that way um, we're making this place, country a better place for everyone. So love being back, sorry I'm gonna have to run out uh, and really appreciate you guys. Thank, Thank you, you, Marlon.